Barbing barbu. The Cascade Mountains in Washington State. They're kind of an unpredictable place. I mean, the mountains themselves, they span over 500 miles. They go through like three different states, two different countries. They go through Northern California, Oregon, Washington, all the way into British Columbia. It's not even how big the mountain range is. It's all about the trees. That's what it's known for. The park, the mountain range, they have these thick, dense trees. And every which way you turn, there's just more trees. They aren't even like the delicate trees with the flowers blooming on top with the tiny little tree trunks. These are conifer evergreen trees. If you've ever seen them before, I mean, they're massive. They kind of look like pine trees, but if you just shave off the bottom half and let them grow up to be like 200 feet tall, 20 stories tall, it's the type of woods that if you look away for two seconds too many, all the people that you came hiking with, they could disappear behind the massive tree trunks. The trunks themselves of each single tree are incredibly thick, about nine feet in diameter. So that means if there's someone standing on the other side of a single tree, just watching you, following you, listening to you, you wouldn't even know it. There are pictures of humans standing in the dense forests in Washington, packed with these types of trees, and it's terrifying. It gives you the same feeling those deep sea videos give. It feels kind of suffocating, but also beautiful, but terrifying. It's one of the last places that you would want to get lost at night. People have reported what it felt like to get lost in the woods like this. And they said that, you know, in the beginning, you feel confident. You're like, yeah, no, I'm headed right in the direction that I came from. You start overestimating how much each tree looks different to you, how distinct it looks. You start overestimating your own abilities. And then after an hour, you're sweating, you're panting, you're panicking, you're whipping your head around. All you see are more trees and you realize all you did was take one big circle around and you are right back where you started. And now the sun is setting. A lot of terrifying stories have come out of the Cascade Mountain Range in Washington. Sightings of Bigfoot, ghost stories, people gone missing. But more recently, one of the most terrifying stories to come out of the thick wooded mountains was that of Camp Keller and the monster that lived at the camp. About 25 miles east of Seattle, in like the middle of these trees, in the middle of a mountain, it's about an hour off the closest trail, so people don't dare venture off into this area. But if you did, if you looked really, really closely, you might see on the mountainside, there are some tree branches that feel really out of place. They don't look like they fell off the tree naturally. They don't look like that they belong there. It's almost like someone grabbed a pile of branches and piled them up on these random spots. It's so odd. If you walk closer and you hear all the twigs snapping beneath your foot, you would see a tiny wooden door underneath the branches but that's so weird because why would a mountain have a door if you open the door you would be inside the mountain welcome to camp keller it is a bunker for the end of the world if you were to make it this far into the mountains the owner of the bunker would have likely heard you approaching and would have been watching you through binoculars debating on what to do with you now which is exactly what chafee was trying to avoid Usually, when Chafee was tracking humans, he would do it on his hands and knees. He would just crouch down onto the ground, staring at the muddy terrain, studying the surface for what he calls signals, which are track marks. Chafee is a human? Yes, Chafee's oh, a human. Okay. Every broken twig, every boot print, he would be examining it. But Chafee and his partner wouldn't be able to do that today because the person that they're tracking doesn't want to be found. So they dressed up as little tourists and they got lost from the main hiking trail. They look like a young, naive couple in the woods. They're stopping to take sips of their water while they glance around. They're taking pictures, reaching into their red backpacks for little snacks. But Chafee was experienced. One step into the woods and he knew that he wasn't alone. Five steps into these woods and he knew that he was on the right track to find Peter Keller, the man who lived in that bunker. The man who had murdered two people in cold blood and was going to do it again unless Chafee tracked him down. Peter Keller had spent the past eight years building a secret bunker filled with weapons in the mountain. He had stockpiles of explosives, pipe bombs, ammunition, rifles, chemicals to create other weapons of destruction. He was going to create a lab inside the mountain to study viruses. And he documented the whole thing in a series of vlogs. 
The videos start off very predictable. Peter would talk about how the building process was going for the bunker. Today we're hauling up a 55 pound pack, basically a big bottle full of beans that's about 45 pounds and some wine making stuff and then it's the weight of the gun and really got a lot of stuff up. We got propane, gasoline, food. I mean basically I can last months up here without ever leaving. He vlogged about what problems he faced when building a cabin underground. He never showed too much of the bunker itself. Maybe he didn't want to like give away his location. I don't know. But he would frame the camera at his face and you would just see the sky above him. And his hair was usually really disheveled from all the construction work that he's doing. This winter has been pretty brutal. It's been really slowing me down. I was hoping to be done about a month ago, but it's just constantly snowed. Last month has just been really, really wet and rainy. Just couldn't do anything for a long time. He also vlogged about why he built this fortress in the first place. He said it was because he was ugly. What? How did I get so f***ed up? How did so many things go wrong? I don't think it's all my fault. I think it's more upbringing. Family life. I was just too ugly. Nobody cared. I guess it's also because I don't have anything. I never did. No money. My looks are horrible. I've tried to to make it in this world and it just isn't happening. I'm 40 now and I am running out of time. I'm getting to the point where I'm just trying to live and pay bills and live as a civilian and go to work. I just that just freaks me out. It's actually more comfortable for me to think about living out here, robbing banks, pharmacies, just taking what I want for as long as I can. At least it'll be exciting. It won't be boring. He wants to rob people? Yeah. Businesses? Yeah. He documented how he had plans to kill two people in order to move into this bunker. He talked through his own feelings and thoughts about the double homicide that he was planning on committing. Well, before, a while ago, I used to sit here and think, you know, this whole thing is just crazy. Now, I guess with time, I just think that way all the time, that this is what I gotta do to, I don't even question it anymore. It just seems like everything makes so much sense now. Just the more I've thought about it, the more I understand it. I don't really feel bad about it. It's just the way it is. And I don't have to worry about Lynette or Kayleen. And everything will be taken care of, It'll just be me. By the time Chafee and his partner were tracking Peter Keller in the woods, he would have already killed those two women. And he was planning to kill again very, very soon, unless Chafee stopped him. So they're tracking him, he's tracking them, and by the end, another person would be dead. This is the evil case of Peter Keller, the murderer who believed the world was coming to an end and that doomsday was approaching. Or so he claims. We would like to thank today's sponsors who have made it possible for Rotten Mango to support Futures Without Violence, who has been fighting to eradicate family violence against women and children. They provide individual resources as well as legal change and advocacy. This episode's partnerships have also made it possible to support Rotten Mango's growing team of dedicated researchers and translators. And we would also like to thank you guys for your continued support as we work on our mission to be worthy advocates of these causes. Now, as always, full show notes are available at Rotten mangopodcast.com but with any case if there's anything miscommunicated or any additional details that you may know please let us know down in the comments and with that being said let's get started there is a place in kansas where you can buy a windowless condo it's not even 2,000 square feet it's about 1,820 square feet and it costs three million dollars in kansas okay love kansas what? but that is on par with manhattan prices if not pricier you get no view no windows even or at least no real windows you have simulated views TV screens that look like windows with a little frame around it, but no real windows. Additionally, if you were to move in, you would be obligated to provide free labor for the condo building at least four hours a day. You would have to work for the building that you just paid $3 million to buy a unit inside of. 
You also cannot leave the condo building unless they give you permission to leave. You can't even move in anytime soon. Or at least probably not anytime soon. So you're paying $3 million for a condo with no windows. You can't even move in and use your actual condo anytime soon. And if you do end up moving in, you are obligated to work four hours a day and cannot leave without permission from the building. Who on earth would spend $3 million in a condo like that? Billionaires. Billionaires are lining up to purchase these underground condos in Kansas because they're bunkers. Rich people and their bunkers have been such a hot topic recently. I mean, the Facebook meta founder Mark Zuckerberg has recently been in the news for allegedly building a 5,000 square foot underground shelter underneath his Hawaii estate. Allegedly, it's a bunker. It's said to have its own energy and food supplies and, quote, what appears to be a blast resistant door. Look, we have no idea if this is true, but it's not that crazy if it is. I mean, wealthy people have been so very much into doomsday prepping and building bunkers. Wait, so the Kansas City one that you're talking about? Yes. Is it already being built or is it It's built. Done? Or it's done. Oh. They have an indoor pool. They have gyms. Oh. They have shooting ranges. They have a full food supply. I think it can sustain all of the units for like five years. They have air filtration centers. It so, used to be a U.S. missile silo. So are there people in there? I don't think you can live in there. Oh, so this is only open when the time arrives. Yes, precisely. They have a helipad for billionaires to fly in. And when the time comes, you go in and you bunker down. Is it nice in there? Did you see? It looks not that nice <laughs> for $3 million. Yeah, for $3 million? Yeah. It's crazy. So what's the four hours labor? Yeah, you have to either help with the food processing or mm. cleaning the filtration. Everybody has to hold their weight wow and it's sold out i'm assuming there's only two on sale right now wow the rest of the units i think there's dozens of units and this is only just one of the buildings that this company is doing it's called survival condo they have multiple multi-million dollar uh bunkers wow all right guys two left <laughs> two left yeah i think the cheaper one is only half of a floor and that's like 1.5 they say it's the cheaper one right we have nine foot ceilings you see the dishwasher there's a built-in microwave and uh, of course this there's a um, all stainless backsplash and uh, full hood uh, electronic window we can change that to four different views it's a live high definition feed from the surface wow. yeah there are companies whose whole business plan is to cater to the ultra wealthy's undying survival instincts have you heard of oppidum it's a Swiss company that helps build bunkers, bespoke bunkers, custom made underneath your existing mansion bunkers. Mm. They can build 10,000 square foot structures that are 50 feet below ground and they are built to withstand NATO standard ballistic and blast protection levels. Wow. They use the same level of high density concrete that nuclear power plants use, but they look nothing like a nuclear power plant. They look like a Four Seasons hotel. The entire bunker is airlocked. You get your own decontamination chamber when you walk in so that none of that air you're bringing in. The main door to the bunker uses iris and palm recognition technology, and they're blast proof so nobody can get in. Once you're in, you have beautiful 16 foot ceilings. I mean, nobody even lives in houses this beautiful. So this is just somebody's bunker. It's beautiful, it's incredible. And of course, all of your priorities will be straight in the case of an apocalypse. The bunker comes with massive garages to showcase your luxury vehicles, art galleries, the art galleries are created with perfect top of the line fire protection, ventilation, temperature, and humidity control systems like you would expect in a museum. That's crazy. Like, yeah. when you're talking about just to survive and they have to put in some artwork and some cars. And That's what I'm saying. That is some twisty, twisty stuff. That's some Hunger Games capital stuff. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't even make any sense. Exactly. What yeah. are you going to do with your Picasso when we're all fighting to stay alive? Yeah. When you need a can of beans, no one's going to be looking at your Picasso, buddy. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. If you choose the bespoke line, you can get an indoor garden with a full pond and a koi fish, automatic irrigation system included, and on top of the garden, 
garden. There's a full ceiling skylight that makes you feel like you're outside. It has full light spectrum simulation so you can make it depict a sunrise, a sunset, and changes in the season. Wait, these are done too? They made these already? This is their plan. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. You have lap pools, personal gyms, home theaters, and even if they make one, I don't think we'll ever see the light of day. Allegedly, Mark Zuckerberg's bunker plans, craziest NDAs ever. So most people, they make you sign an NDA. You'll never even see the plan for the bunker, which makes sense. Interesting, right? A lot of these bunkers come with personal gyms, home theaters, NASA-level technology to allow food to be stored for months or even years, a full infirmary that comes with essential medical supplies, backup water sources, backup generators, a full-scale air filtration center. I mean, it's crazy. The main designer of Oppidum stated that these bunkers are not for everyone and that his clients are, quote, the most powerful individuals in the world. Clearly, because... It's not cheap. The starting price is $10 million, but the bespoke models, the custom-made bunkers, they range in the hundreds of millions of dollars. One very wealthy head of investment firm said, I keep a helicopter gassed up all the time. I have an underground bunker with an air filtration system. A lot of my friends do the guns and motorcycles and the gold coins, you know, because you want to be able to trade later, but... Those people aren't too rare anymore. Wait, this is just like the movie we did. Yes, was leave the world behind. Yes. Another guy high up in the tech world said, there's a bunch of us in the valley. We meet up and have these financial hacking dinners and talk about backup plans people are doing. It runs the gamut from a lot of people stocking up on Bitcoin and crypto to figuring out how to get second passports if they need it to having a vacation home in other countries that we could escape to. I'll be candid. I'm stockpiling now on real estate to generate passive income, but also to have a lot of safe havens to go to. He said that he, his wife, and their four-year-old daughter have a set of bags packed for themselves, never unpack it. It's just on the corner of their house by the front door so that they can be ready to go at any given moment. He said, I kind of have this terror scenario. Oh my God, if there's a civil war or a giant earthquake that cleaves off a part of California, we need to be ready. In the wealthy circles, doomsday prepping is not that rare anymore, which, of course, begs the question of what do they know that we don't know? And maybe this is reassuring. Maybe it's not. But the former CEO of Reddit stated, most people just assume improbable events don't happen. But technical people, they tend to view risk very mathematically. The tech preppers, they don't necessarily think a collapse is likely. They consider it a very remote event, but one with very severe downsides. So given how much money they have, spending like a tiny fraction of their net worth to hedge against that is a very logical thing to do. But what about everybody else? They get crafty. That's the only way. You have to build your own bunker if that's what you think you need to survive in the future. Now, the Keller family did not really look like bunker people. Not that doomsday preppers have a certain look to them or anything of that sort, but they didn't look like the type of family to have a bunker 20 feet deep into the side of an isolated mountain in the woods. I feel like that takes a very specific type of person. 41-year-old Peter Keller was the dad of the family, and he was quite a reserved guy who was really introverted, but there was no ominous undertone to it. It was less of, he's so quiet, he must be hiding something, but more so of the, oh, I bet this guy is just shy. That was the impression that everybody had of him. But he did have a strong obsession with guns. I don't know how much of that translated to the outside world, like if he went around telling people about his passion for firearms or not. And this might be a controversial take, but I think that when you have someone who is quieter, reserved, almost secretive, that type of person, their partners make them feel a lot more likable to a degree. And for Peter, that's his wife, Lynette. She's the likable one in the relationship. Lynette was working on building up her own scrapbooking business. She would sit there, and painstakingly fold these paper flowers that she would haul to the local fair to sell them. She would also make these really cute scrapbooking kits and put them up on her online shop to make money. And yeah, okay, I'm sure a huge part of it is she genuinely enjoys creating something with her own hands, and maybe that process is comforting for her. But the other part of it, she just wanted to contribute to the family finances again. A while back, Lynette had been in a workplace injury where she hurt her back. 
I don't think that she received much workers' compensation, if any. I wasn't able to verify it, but don't quote me on it. I do think that she did receive state disability payments, which on average is like $1,400. So I don't know if Lynette was getting $1,400 and how consistently it was, but she was in chronic pain ever since that incident. She was unable to work anymore, and she felt really bad that Peter was the sole breadwinner, and she just wanted to contribute that's it. It was really hard for people to not like Lynette. I mean, chronic pain, it makes it hard for people to consistently and constantly be positive and happy. We know someone who has chronic pain and it's not a pretty daily routine that they go through. They don't have like this sunshine and rainbows day. When you're in pain, do you have the energy to smile and make everybody else around you feel comfortable when it feels like your entire body is on fire? Someone with chronic pain describes it as, Envision last night, you do a full body workout that hurts so much, all the muscles are aching. Then after the workout, you go out into the hot sun, take off all your clothes and lay out fully nude without sunscreen until your entire body gets sunburned and your skin is peeling. And then after that, you throw on whatever scratchy, itchy clothes that you have laying around. And then you go into the city for three too many drinks and now it's the next morning. They said that's what waking up with chronic pain feels like every single morning, even if you will go to sleep at 7 p.m. the night before. It hurts to move anything. If anything touches your skin, it hurts. You have a massive headache. You want to throw up. That happens every single day, and it's almost impossible to stay positive and happy all the time. I mean, how can you when it feels like life is playing a joke on you? So that's how Lynette felt, and not a single person would have blamed her for not being sunshine and rainbows every single day, but Lynette was the type of person that you wish you had known sooner. Losing weight isn't easy, especially when it feels like we're constantly being pressured into trying the newest healthy diet or exercise plan. There's always another person in the corner or online telling you exactly what you need to do and everything else doesn't work. You go keto for two weeks, then you go paleo, then you're on a three-day juice cleanse. And there is nothing wrong with any of these things individually. But if you are just throwing everything at yourself to try and lose weight, it is a lot of stress on the body. And losing weight can be a healthy goal, but adding stress to your body, the body that loves you so much, is just not how you want to go about things. There's a much much better and more sustainable way to lose weight and reach your goals. The Row Body Program is here to support you. They've already helped over 200,000 people reach their weight loss goals. Row has a team of medical experts that will help you make sustainable changes to your lifestyle that you can actually stick with. If you need additional support, Row provides access to some of the most popular weight loss shots on the market that you can pair with your new healthy lifestyle. On average, people lose 15 to 20 percent of their body weight in a single year with Row. The best part? The weight actually stays off. You don't need to worry about booking any in-person appointments. Sign up for Row from the comfort of your own home. So to finally lose that stubborn weight, go to row.co slash rotten. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 for your first month and $145 a month after that. Average the weight loss is 15 to 20% in one year with healthy lifestyle changes. BMI and other eligibility criteria apply. Medication costs are separate. That's ro.co slash rotten. Even when Lynette and Peter's 18-year-old daughter, Kayleen, was graduating from high school, Peter was taking a video of her at her graduation, and you can tell which parent brings Kayleen out of her shell. Peter asks, so how do you feel, Kayleen? And she just kind of shrugs. Lynette is in the background screaming excitedly, no more high school, yay! I feel pretty good. Peter asks if she feels different, and she just kind of shakes her head no. But when Lynette asks, she's like, you don't feel different? She shrugs and says, I guess. And Lynette excitedly shouts, you got a new life ahead of you. No more freaking school. Well, high school. Peter says, yeah, you got till tomorrow to get your stuff and get out of the house. And Lynette shuts him down. Oh, no, she's living with us forever. Sorry, Carson. So that's Kaylin's boyfriend. And she says, forever. So how do you feel, Kayleen? <laughs> no more high school, yay! Feel different? No? You don't feel different? You got a new life ahead of you. No more freaking school. Oh, high school. Yeah, you got to tell tomorrow to get your stuff out of the house. Oh, so. no. She's living with us forever. Sorry, Carson. So Peter just loves to vlog, is that why? 
It seems like the whole family had an interest in videos. Mm. Yeah. So they documented everything. Lynette would also vlog her scrapbooking journey. Mm. And not, like I said, not a single person would have blamed her for being frustrated with her life and her inability to work or her back injury. But she was grateful for every single thing. I'm so sorry. Yes. Are these videos posted on YouTube? Or? So here's the crazy thing. It is posted by it's not one person i think it's a whole team of people called explore with us they do true crime documentaries i'm not sure how they got the footage i wonder if it was an foia request mm. so they are so the they, only ones i've seen with this footage so they record it but they don't post on youtube or anything it's for their personal record i think it was taken down if it was posted mm, I yes see. now the police did release like a 10 minute video of peter's vlogs in the woods Yes, but the, the videos of Lynette, I haven't been able to see them anywhere else. Lynette just wanted to give back to her caring husband. I mean, she looked for every avenue for herself to make money. She tried selling the paper flowers at the market, like I was telling you. She put up the scrapbooking kits. She even tried vlogging to see if maybe she could promote her business and bring in ad revenue. Even though she's not working and earning money for the family, I mean, at least she's constantly trying. She said in a vlog where she's sitting in her scrapbooking room, my husband a few months ago went out and bought me this big recliner for my back and I'm just now starting to use it. And he's so happy. Usually I sit on the love seat. I love this chair though. You know, he's here, he's supporting me. He takes care of me even though I can't go back to work and I'm home and I'm in pain all the time. He gave me my scrapbooking room, my dream come true. So even for her wedding anniversary with Peter, she didn't ask for some grand materialistic thing or something to indulge in, which again, nobody would have judged her if she had, but she just asked for ribbons. Ribbons for her scrapbooking business to hopefully bring in more money to the family. She said about Peter, he's a great guy. Some guys, you know, they just kind of leave when you get that, you know, it's part of your vows. But anyway, I don't want to get into all of that. He's a great guy here. Yeah. You know, he stuck around with me. I'm, uh, you know, some some guys are kind of leave when you get that. You know, it's it's part of your vows. But anyways, I don't want to get on to that. She would vlog about how thoughtful Peter was. I mean, it was in every little action that he did. She said, "Sorry, my dog is being crazy right now. My husband is probably chasing him around the living room." I know, my husband spoils me. He hates seeing me in pain, so tonight he came home and gave me another $20 because he knows I'm going to the doctor's tomorrow and he just wants me to stop by Michael's and get some more stuff. In another video, Lynette said, My husband's great. He's very respectful to me. He spoils me. He takes care of me. I know, my husband spoils me. He hates seeing me in pain, so tonight he came home and he gave me another $20 because he knows I'm going to the doctor's tomorrow and he wants me to stop at Michael's and get some more stuff. Peter worked refurbishing computers and it's reported that he was a computer engineer. And it does seem like he made a pretty good living. Lynette told her family that Peter was great with his finances and she believed that when they retire, they were set up to be millionaires. Not that Lynette had any plans to like start blowing any of this money or spending like crazy. She just really wanted a few ribbons and ink from Michael's here and there. And she was so grateful. She was not with Peter for the money. She worked really hard to contribute to her family in other ways, given her circumstances, which is so admirable. And then Kayleen, their daughter, their only child, she graduated high school and she was on track to start at Bellevue College in the fall. She was interested in environment protection, in gaming, in videos, camera equipment, which I'm sure everyone always told Peter he was so lucky to have a daughter that was interested in the same thing that he was interested in. Like it's just another added layer of connection to have with your kid, something to bond over, like this shared passion. It's pretty rare. They would even joke around together. Like they had the typical dad and daughter humor. Kayleen would vlog her dad sitting on the couch and he would just look at her and bluntly ask, are you gonna take a picture of me and sell me on eBay? Can you take a picture of me and sell me on eBay? It's like a solid dad joke. Friends of the Keller said, Kayleen had a special bond with her dad. Kaylin's uncle said, you know, we'd go there for the holidays and it was like every father and daughter relationship. She would look at her dad and say, daddy, can I have this? And he would say, sure. Like she was in her own way, daddy's little girl. Perhaps Peter would want to go to the ends of the earth to protect his family from the outside world and make sure that nothing happens to them in the event of a catastrophic end for the world. Maybe that's why he built the bunker. There was only one problem with that though. He only had room for one. What? 
The Kellers clearly were not the perfect family, but all of their friends and family were under the impression that they were pushing through the hard times. Life was going to give them a big break soon, but Peter was over it. I just feel like I'm getting knocked back financially. My wife is just, just going to suck all the money out that I have. Peter turns on the camera and it feels like he's expecting us to watch his videos. He does retakes to make sure that the message comes across exactly the way that he wants it to. All we can see is his face and the trees behind him. We can't even pinpoint where in the woods he is. It's almost pointed towards the sky and it's like placed near his chest going up and he just looks crazed. He says, Well, it's about two weeks before the end. This is going to be my last video till after that. Um, that's terrible. Ugh, that's terrible. He puts the camera down and he tries again. Well, it's about two weeks before I finally drop out of society and start this project. He puts the camera down. Two weeks before I finally drop out of society. He doesn't like the wording of that. So he puts the camera down and he starts again. Well, it's about two weeks before we finally drop out of society and fully commit to this. Well, it's about two weeks before we finally drop out of society and fully commit to this. Very interesting, the switch here of him saying I and then changing it to we. It's just weird. We meaning who though? Just him. Yeah. But he changed it for a reason. Yeah. He continues. I just wanted to get one last video in before uh, that time. So far, I'm come to terms with it doing okay it's starting to accept it doesn't really freak me out anymore like it did sometimes it's clear that he's preparing for something he cryptically vlogs finally i have to do what i have to do and get it out of the way at this point i don't know what's gonna happen i may get caught right away Basically, if I get caught, I'm just going to shoot myself. I could basically be dead in two or three weeks. I don't know. It's all up to chance at this point. I don't think anyone knows where I'm at. But if they put it together, who knows? At this point, I had to take that chance. So it's just going to be a point of go as far as I can. I do have my escape and that's death. I can always shoot myself and I'm okay with that. At this point, I don't know what's going to happen. It, I may get uh, caught right away. Basically, if I get caught, I'm just going to shoot myself. So, I mean, I could basically be dead in two weeks or three weeks. I don't know. It's all up to chance at this point. I do have my escape, and that's death. <laughs> I can always shoot myself, and I'm okay with that. We don't know exactly when Peter decided to kill his wife and only child, but we do know that he had been planning the construction of the bunker since 2003 for the past eight years. He had been sketching, tweaking, building his bunker. Peter's friends and family did say that he was developing a bit of a, quote, doomsday attitude. They said they would feel comfortable calling him a survivalist. A survivalist with a distaste for authority is how exactly they described him. Side note, from what I can tell, survivalists and preppers are different. And again, I could be wrong because I also see a lot of people say the label of prepper is just a rebranding from survivalist because of the negative connotations. But others argue there is a stark difference. Netizens have stated, while both people have the goal of being prepared, preppers if you will, they tend to focus on resource management and planning for unforeseeable scenarios to unfold. They will be the ones stockpiling food, water, medical supplies. For preppers, these things could be necessary if there's a natural disaster, social unrest, economic meltdowns, or a full cyber attack. Preppers believe in the power of preparation, and they come up with evacuation routes, communication methods, satellite phones, in case things go down. They will learn how to purify water, they will focus on gaining basic knowledge for medical care, things of that nature. Nature. Whereas from what I can tell, survivalists, on the other hand, they tend to be more focused on survival. They want to learn how to start a fire without a match, build a shelter from natural materials, forage food from the wild, navigate without a compass. Typically, not all, but from what I can see online, survivalists tend to prepare for more apocalyptic scenarios. They prefer adaptability over a stocked pantry. And this is a huge generalization, but preppers seem like they prefer groups or they prefer like-minded individuals. 
They think that if something were to happen, there is power in community and strength in numbers. Survivalists, from what I can see online, they tend to be more lone wolves. Most survivalists, maybe they just want to take their family or a friend or two. They want to get off the grid far away from other people as possible. They want to find a resource heavy area that people won't be settling into. And that's where they want to just station out, camp out until maybe the world goes back to normal. Obviously, there's going to be people who cross over, survivalists who have prepper traits, vice versa. But I would say in most SHTF shit hit the fan situations, a mixture of both would probably be optimal in terms of surviving. Peter Keller was a survivalist with a doomsday attitude. That's what they called him. So he's prepping for doomsday scenarios. Other preppers and other survivalists, they could be preparing for an earthquake that maybe would cut off water supply for 10 million people for a month, maybe a few weeks. If there's another large scale indefinite power outage, they're preparing for that. Or pandemic shortages, ice storms that keep them locked in for weeks. They call it prepping for Tuesday just prepping for an emergency. Huh. You just don't know when it's gonna hit. It's not the end of the world, it's just a big emergency. Like a massive hurricane that could be devastating. That's what they're preparing for. Doomsday prepping is prepping for a global catastrophic risk, which again, does not seem that inconceivable with the way things are going, so I'm not judging anyone. I don't think anything is inherently bizarre with wanting to prepare for the worst case scenarios. I think even the act of being proactive can give people a sense of, easing that anxiety that they have and i'm all for that so obviously the way that it unfolds in today's case is not representative of these groups of people but beyond that you would be surprised at how many people are preparing for something like this i feel like back then people had a very specific person in mind when they thought of survivalist but even reddit's co-founder and ceo steve huffman stated he got lasik eye surgery because quote if the world ends and not even if the world ends but if we have trouble getting contacts or glasses, it's going to be a huge pain in the ass. Without them, I'm f***ed. That's an interesting reason to get heck. He said, I own a couple motorcycles. I have a bunch of guns and ammo, food. I figure with that, I can hole up in my house for some amount of time. So this is becoming increasingly normal. Now, Peter's bunker was a cabin inside the mountain called Camp Keller. Authorities would later be very impressed by the sheer size of the thing. It was an elaborate space. I mean, envision a log cabin made of wood, two floors, multiple levels, separated rooms, rooms with air mattresses, pillows, blankets, clothes, stuff to keep you comfortable. You can go inside, go from level to level. There's a pantry, a kitchenette, a bedroom furnace, places to clean up, shower, storage rooms. Well, you say this is inside of a mountain? Inside of the mountain. He dug a... He excavated the inside of a mountain and what's crazy is he can't even bring up crazy tools. So the way that this mountain where it's placed is it's about an hour hike off the trail. So he would have to get out of his car, go onto the hike for maybe about 45 minutes, then get off the trail to his bunker location. That would take another hour of heavy non-hike trekking up the mountain. So round trip inclined. takes like four hours. Yes. And oh my. all the tools that he would need to excavate the inside of a mountain, he uh -huh. would have to bring on his back. So he's not bringing in heavy duty machinery. Yeah. He's bringing in just like chainsaws. Wow. Did you see photos of inside? Yes. Is it's it crazy. Like, it's not like an Aspen ski resort, but it's crazy that it's inside of a mountain. It looks like a real home. Yeah. No? No, it definitely looks like a bunker. Or it's big. Wow. There's shelving, there's creature comforts, there's everything. It's like a very shed-like log cabin, but inside of the mountain. I mean, he created this pulley system to bring giant logs and trees that he would cut down on the mountain, and he would create this large enough hole into the mountain to now reinforce the walls with those mm. logs. So it's like, again, inverted cabin. And the trees that he's cutting down, they're massive. Some of them are over 50 years old. He would just chop them down, skin them of their bark, split them, and bring them into the hole to fortify the underground cabin. Every aspect of survival, or at least comfort survival he had power he managed to haul a generator up the mountain he had light switches he could turn on the lights with the click of a little switch water he created a water system he picked the spot of his bunker to be next to a small stream he ran pvc pipes from the stream into the bunker to get running water Whoa. 
heat. He made a wood burning furnace with one of those aluminum trash cans. He cut a hole on the side and he would throw in wood and just burn it. He had ventilation so he wouldn't die of carbon monoxide inside of the bunker. He had a wood burning stove. Murder? Peter had stacks of ammunition boxes in Ziploc bags. He had high powered rifles, tons of fuel containers. He purchased a bulletproof vest, binoculars. He had scopes in there, which is a device that you put on your gun so that you can see where your bullet is aiming and where it's gonna impact. He even stockpiled bottles of water, Coca-Cola, vodka. He had a bucket filled with his favorite candy, which are 100 grand bars. That's the name of the candy, as well as regular day-to-day -day necessities like Windex and laundry detergent. The bunker has been described as a shocking feat of engineering. So, I mean, most of the supplies were either from the woods around him, like he would cut down the trees, or any additional supplies he would have to haul from his house, which again, like we said, would be a two-hour hike up the mountain, half of it off trail, which if you guys go hiking off trail, I would say is 10 times harder than on a trail. He never really shows too much of the actual bunker when he vlogs, but there is a clip where he briefly shows the camera some of his surroundings at night before he heads home. And he says, Well, this is the end of the day. I'm getting wrapped up, getting ready to leave. I don't know if you can see me, but it's kind of one last look. That's my fireplace, wood stove, whatever. Now we're going upstairs. You just see like big black trash bags piled around. They look like body bags. This is where most of my supplies are. Pretty well stocked up. And that pretty much wraps it up for the day. He also vlogs some of the challenges he had creating the bunker. Today is probably the nicest day it's been in a long time. As you can see, I have about three loads left before the final. Um, I've got three loads left before the final. Um, mm. I think he's referencing the murder here. Been doing pretty good lately, getting about two loads up a week, about 100 pounds each week now of supplies and material. This winter, is, well, we had a big ice storm. This is one of the trees that's fallen down over the trail, kind of another one over there. A lot of damage, branches down everywhere. Makes it a little more difficult to get through, but I don't want to move it. I'd like to keep it as hard to get through here so nobody will come out here. Peter would go every weekend for nine hours a day, work nonstop for nine-ish hours on his bunker. Any energy that he had would be used up on his hike down back to his car. And he wasn't necessarily all alone in the woods each time. He would bring his family dog with him, Dino. I would say medium-sized black dog. It looks kind of like a schnauzer. I want to first show you, look at Dino. He just got a haircut a couple days ago. My husband was like, he's looking too scruffy. So he would bring up Dino, and most of the time, after a really long day working on the bunker, he would need two days to physically recover before he made it back to the bunker. It was physically taxing. And every day, he's making that choice to keep going back to his plan. He could have backed out or changed his mind at any moment, but he didn't. And this went on for eight years? Yes. And the wife had no idea that he she was She knew that it. he had a bunker. What? Yeah, we're going to get into it. Huh. April 20th, 2012, Peter gave Lynette some money. She vlogged about how excited she was. She originally told Peter that she was going to buy some stamps with the money he gave her, but she changed her mind and thought that she was going to buy ink instead. She was giddy over the idea of having more ink. She said, oh my gosh, so awesome. Sorry, I'm trying not to get too excited because my husband is going to be like, what are you doing? My husband actually gave me some money and I was going to go out and buy some of these. But I'm going to go buy ink instead. Oh my gosh. So awesome. Sorry, I'm trying not to get too excited because my husband's going to be like, what are you doing? Lynette would never get to use that money. And Peter knew that. The world was supposed to end in 2012. For years, people were talking about it. December 21st, 2012, that's the last day of the world. Some said there's going to be a giant tidal wave. All the land is going to be flooded on the planet. Others stated, no, 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 that's dumb. It's going to be a worldwide earthquake. Mm -hmm. Or a volcanic eruption that's going to spread through all the continents. What some people say, like, another meteor is going to strike. Yes, other people said, oh, actually, Earth is going to collide with a mysterious a meteor. Some people called it a Planet X. And then mm -hmm. they would be sucked into the black hole and disappear, regardless of the method of transportation to the end of the world. It was argued that the apocalypse had been predicted since ancient Maya. It was argued that the Maya developed the long count calendar. That calendar lasted about 5,139 solar years, and the last day was December 12th, 2012. 
Now, a lot of people, they thought, yeah, well, that's how a yearly calendar works. You know, like at the end of 2024, we're going to get a new calendar that's 2025. It, just a new cycle would commence, right? Mm -hmm. But others believed, no. The Maya, they knew what they were talking about. It's not going to reset itself. We're all going to die. This is the end of the world. Some others argued there are other weird things that are happening. The stars are literally aligning for the end of the world. That day was also going to be the winter solstice and the Milky Way and the equator, they would align. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, but there were a lot of other things that went into a ton of people believing that the world was going to end in 2012. We're not certain if Peter was one of these believers of this date, but December 12th, 2012 was scheduled to be the end of the world, scheduled to be Armageddon. In just a few months prior, April 22nd, 2012, it felt like the end of the world on 159th Street in North Bend, Washington. Neighbors looked out the window and saw bright red angry claws crawling out of their neighbor's window. They ran to their phones and called 911. I see smoke and flames coming out of the neighbor's house. Oh my God, it's coming through the windows. It's getting out of control. You have to get over here right now. Firefighters are not just in charge of putting out a fire. They have to figure out if the fire was accidental or arson, meaning someone lit the fire on purpose. And I always imagined that this job would be nearly impossible. If everything is burned down, how do you even determine if it's arson? Firefighters work their way backwards. If there's something left behind, meaning the building is not burnt to a crisp, they're going to follow the fire patterns to find the center of the ignition, the origin. If it's a plug, they assume it's likely electrical. Stove, perhaps gas leak. But if it's something that feels a bit off, you can run a chemical test to see if there's any sort of gasoline or accelerant that was used. Now, obviously, it's not that simple, but firefighters are highly trained to figure out the cause and source of a fire. April 22nd, 2012, firefighters arrive at the Keller family residence at 8.45 a.m. and they would need to use zero of those skills to practice. They look up, part of the house is engulfed in angry flames. They look down, there are seven gas cans on the ground. Someone wanted the house to burn. Inside the house, the investigators found two bodies. Had investigators arrived at the house a few minutes later, the entire thing would have blown up. But they arrived before the fire could spread. They put out the fire and all the evidence was left behind and they really did not need to know if it was arson or not. In the kitchen, investigators found a five gallon red gas can, the ones that you see at the gas stations to transport gas. It was on top of the stove and the stove was on. Someone put it on top of the stove, turned on the stove to wait for it to ignite. The plastic container of gas had melted from the heat and it was causing gas to spill out everywhere that quickly was engulfed in flames. They found three two gallon gas cans that had been set throughout the house so that when the fire spread, they would accelerate the flames. Additionally, authorities found a pipe bomb that failed to go off. Now, side note, a pipe bomb is essentially a homemade bomb or what they formally call an IED, which is an improvised explosive device. Typically, it's made from steel water pipes. So think of like a steel tube. PVC pipes can also be used, but usually the steel ones are more popular and inside is a mixture of explosive materials and then it's closed on both sides to create pressure there's a fuse running through it so like a string that's typically made of electrical wire and attached to some sort of battery or timer the pressure that builds inside the pipe bomb not only makes it dangerous from a receiving perspective but also from an assembling perspective that's why they're not as popular as you might imagine because everything is pretty easy to purchase Imagine one of those confetti tubes that you pop open and the pressure sends the confetti flying everywhere, but only it's not confetti. People will often add nails or broken glass on the outside of the pipe or inside the pipe to, to increase pain, destruction, and death. But even just the outer metal shell is dangerous because that's what becomes shrapnel. The power of the boom of the mixture inside, it shreds the metal of the usually steel pipe and it sends it just like hurling in whoever is in the vicinity at very high speeds. And a lot of times it detonates while it's being assembled. So that's why it's just, you know, beyond the ethical, moral and law standpoint, highly unadvisable just yeah the u.s department of homeland security recommends keeping at least like a thousand foot distance from a pipe bomb even a homemade pipe bomb the pipe bomb in the keller residence thankfully did not explode but if it had it could have easily killed every single firefighter on site that day trying to put out the fire so to recap, authorities found clear and obvious signs of arson, a pipe bomb that thankfully did not detonate. And unfortunately, that is not the only thing that authorities found. 
They found 41-year-old Lynette Keller dead in her bedroom. 18-year-old Kayleen was also found dead, both with gunshot wounds to the head. Their family dog, Dino, that appeared in so many of Lynette's videos, but also went to the woods with Peter on a consistent, routinely basis no. to build the bunker, was also found shot dead, along with their family cat. This was no longer just the scene of a fire. It was a double homicide crime scene. And authorities, they were quick to start going from room to room to process as much evidence as possible. And thankfully, they get there soon enough that the fire stayed contained in the kitchen. The rest of the house was combed through for evidence. Peter's hard drive being the key into figuring out what happened in the Keller family home. Forensic investigators were able to get access into his hard drive and they, they found pictures a lot of pictures taken over the course of nine years. I mean, I imagine that the first few photos started off with just sketches, floor plans, notes, and then it quickly evolved into the mountain, the woods, random trees here and there. And with each scroll, the photos just kept evolving into something darker and darker until you saw Camp Keller over the course of almost a decade come together, picture by picture. The police could see what it was now, what it was escalating into. They saw hand-drawn plans for the bunker and a note written by Peter about one of the floor plans for the rooms. He said he wanted to build a lab for viruses and nanobots. Nanobots? Like yeah. So nanobots are tiny little robots that are about a m one millimeter in length, which is about like the tip of a sewing needle. And they're mainly being experimented and tested in the medical field to go inside the human body and, for example, destroy cancer cells. They're tiny little robots. Yeah, yeah, I think I read about this when I was super young, but... Yeah, and they're in development right now. I mean, it's we're still looking at at least a decade out is what a lot of experts are saying, but authorities, they have no clue what any of that even means. Like, what kind of virus is he trying to study? Where is he getting his hands on nanobots? And the combination of the two, the viruses and the nanobots being in the same room, is not ideal. They needed to track down Peter Keller. People underestimate human trackers you know in movies you see scent dogs looking for fugitives in the woods or you see the infrared camera scanning the area from helicopters but sometimes it just takes a human to track a human sometimes all it takes is an expert to go into the woods and just look stand and look they say that you need to look for small branches that have been snapped in half someone stepped on it or a plant that's kind of leaning awkwardly to one side Someone brushed past it when they walked aside it. Or maybe mud on the tree trunks. Humans have a strong instinct to want to rub mud off of our shoes when we're in that type of terrain. There are other things that we all do without even thinking about it. When we walk, we all have a dominant side that we distribute extra weight on. And just by looking at a picture of us walking, a lot of these human trackers can tell which is our dominant side. Exactly what our footprint will look like in the mud. Or depending on your speed, your weight is distributed differently and great trackers just by looking at your boot print can tell if you are walking at a leisurely pace, skipping or running. Sometimes they say the only way to throw trackers off is to tie your shoes on backwards. So you put, you get your tennis shoes, you put your feet on top of your tennis shoes. You don't put them in your shoes backwards. Okay. And then you tie the laces on the top of your foot. But they can still see footprints. Yes, but it'll be in the opposite direction. But even then, a good tracker will probably be able to find you. And Chafee, he was a good tracker. Once he and his partner found Peter's tracks, they called in the SWAT team. Three dozen SWAT officers came with faces streaked in camouflage paint up the Cascade Mountains, and they start sneaking uphill. Peter had the advantage here. He's higher up. He has rifles, scopes, binoculars. If he sees them, he could open fire at any moment. They needed to be as discreet as possible. They ended up slogging in the mud for seven hours, hands and knees, camouflage paint on their face through the steep, muddy terrain rain to get up the mountain without being seen so they f they immediately found out where he was hiding yes they found a picture that could pinpoint where he was mm. i'm gonna get into it and this whole thing was just confusing because everyone in the family at least at one point they all really liked peter 
which I think showcases just how polished of a manipulator he is. I mean, he went from being a family man to be chased by three dozen SWAT officers up a mountain. He was able to hide his true feelings for so long. A lot of people have stated it's utterly terrifying that Peter would wake up, have breakfast with his family, all the while he's planning their murders throughout the day. Even Peter's colleagues at work, they didn't see a single red flag in him. His boss said, I mean, Peter was an excellent employee. I mean, you could set your clock by him. That means he's very punctual. Especially in the beginning of their marriage, I mean, Lynette's family, they really thought that Peter was a kind guy. She had known him since they were in high school, and Lynette was actually the one that did not want to get married. Lynette was like, that is way too much commitment, but Peter kept proposing like three months into their relationship. Lynette's sister was encouraging her, like, he's such a nice guy. Like, it's really hard to find nice people these days. So Lynette, she took a chance on love. She would share her love story in a video and she would say, that's my story of my husband, who, as you know, <laughs> you know, is the love of my life. That's my story of my husband, who is my husband, who's the love of my life. Towards the end, close friends and family did notice Peter changing a little bit. He was withdrawing from social activities and becoming increasingly obsessed with doomsday scenarios. He told friends and family that the world was going to end at some point. Everybody knew that he had a bunker, or most people that were super close with him, like his work people, extended family, they didn't know. But Lynette, Kayleen, even Kayleen's boyfriend knew that Peter was working on Camp Keller. I don't know if they thought he's just up in the woods hanging out. I don't know if they saw pictures to see just how extensive the bunker was. They had no idea where it was, though. I guess my biggest question is, was he prepping to bring the wife and the daughter? It doesn't seem like it. But do they know that? Like, I don't know. I think that they probably are not survivalists and did not think that the end of the world was nearing Mm. who would choose a bunker over their nice home it just didn't make any sense it just felt like oh dad's weird hobby dads go fishing on the weekends mm. my dad builds a bunker it's it, it th there was nothing that alarming about it and i think if they hadn't seen pictures and if they hadn't seen a lot of his preparations i don't think that they would have even know how extensive it was i think they would have just thought he likes to spend time in nature mm. and he's a little bit of a survivalist but they just knew it existed, and that's why Peter would leave at 10 a.m. on the weekends and would return near nighttime. One thing that did bother Lynette's family about Peter was he was a little bit cagey about money, to the point where Lynette would have to ask family members for various expenses here and there. Meanwhile, Peter was sinking thousands of dollars into gun silencers, bulletproof vests, ammo, and creating his bunker in the woods. This bunker was likely booby-trapped. So the SWAT teams, they could not force their way in. Even if they had the means, they didn't know exactly what they're walking into, which is dangerous. All they knew was Peter has a lot of guns and a lot of ammo. He had a pipe bomb at home ready to go off. He betrayed and killed the people that he was supposed to protect. This is the definition of a high stakes, armed and dangerous suspect. So if they can't go in and he doesn't want to come out, what are the SWAT teams going to do? They're going to flush him out. Tear gas smells slightly pleasant at first. According to some sources, I wouldn't know. They say it's slightly sweet. And if you know that you're being tear gas, you might even smirk like, oh my God, it's not even as bad as they say it is. People are so dramatic. I can handle it. But you're in for a surprise. They say first it's the throat. You feel this spicy coating in your throat and it's kind of like glitter. No matter how much you cough, it's sticking to the sides of your esophagus. You cannot get this burning sensation out. And then the panic sets in because you feel like you can't breathe. You're going to suffocate. It feels like nails are just clawing at the inside of your esophagus. And then the mucus starts to take over. Mucus starts pouring out of your nose, whether you want it to or not. Nothing can stop it. Nothing matters anymore except getting rid of this pain. You don't even feel like you're breathing. You feel like you're just breathing knives. And then it's your eyes. You start crying uncontrollably. It's a physiological reaction. It's like emptying an entire bottle of hot sauce straight into your retina. That level of burn. Any exposed skin, it burns. And all it takes is a single whiff. They gas the entire bunker. And they waited. After 10 minutes, nothing. No signs of Peter. They know he's inside. They can kind of hear him. And it sounds like he's breathing through a gas mask. Wow. They have to reconsider. If not gas, then water. They tried to coordinate with the fire department for a hose to be brought up the mountain. They wanted to pump as much water into the bunker as possible. If they can't flush him out, maybe they can flood him out. 
this strategy was a bit difficult to execute, so it was abandoned to a degree. And they were, you know, nearing a full day of trying to get Peter to come out. They tried gas, water, and now it was time for fire. I mean, I guess inside that bunker, it would have felt like the end of the world. They thought, blow it up. They brought Chafee back in. This is the tracker. Not only is he an expert tracker, but he's a bomb tech. How many explosives do we need to blow the lid off this thing? It's not that simple, though. You can use as much as explosives as you want and blow up the entire mountain if your heart so desires. But the key is getting the perfect amount of explosives to blow the log roof off enough just to loosen it from the screws, but not cave the entire structure into the mountain. Once they had the precise amount of explosives, Chafee had to be hoisted down onto the bunker roof by a helicopter. He's coming in with a bag of explosives strapped in between his legs, probably thinking that he does not get paid enough for this. And once it was all set, they blew the lid off the bunker. Sergeant Cindy West stated during the 23-hour stakeout that they were not going anywhere without Peter. She stated, we're not leaving till we get him out one way or another. The sheriff stated, it's a very tactical situation. Time is on our side. We're not going to do anything rash. Side note, the way that they even got to this mountain is kind of crazy. There were a lot of pictures that Peter had taken of the bunker, inside of the bunker, the plans of the bunker, but no picture pinpointed where on the mountains it was. And like I said, Cascade Mountain Range, 500 miles of mountains. They have no idea where Peter could be, but they saw this one picture. And at first glance, it almost looks like a mistake picture. It's a picture of what looks like a shopping plaza and the wooded mountains are right behind it. But the shopping plaza is maybe like 20% of the lower half of the picture. And then just the vast mountains on the back. It's not even beautiful mountains. There's no sunset. It's just a lot of trees, but it stood out to authorities. Why would a man like Peter building a bunker in the mountains just take random photos of a shopping plaza where you can't even see the focal point? There's no subject of the photo. There's no person. There's no store. There's no car that's the subject of the photo. It looks weird. Peter's documentation of the bunker has been meticulous and organized so far. And authorities realized, wait, this just might mean something. It's not a random photo. He must have taken it for a reason. Behind the plaza, you see the mountains. The photo is 80% mountains. And at the bottom, you kind of see this power line running through the mountains. So with the location of the shopping plaza, the location of the power lines, they can kind of pinpoint where the focal point of this photo is. They get a general idea. And they think that's where Peter's bunker is located. Why? Because there's also two streams on that side of the mountain. What do you need when you're building a bunker? Running water. Why would Peter take this picture unless, I don't know, if you were building a bunker on the side of the mountain, wouldn't you want to go somewhere near civilization where people pass by, take a picture just to see, what does it look like from this angle? Can they see me? How much of me can they see? Can they zoom in? That's how they found Peter. They blew the lid off his bunker. They stormed the place and Peter Keller was dead. Autopsy showed that he had put the gun in his mouth the previous night, shot himself through the top floor of the bunker, his body plunged 30 feet to the lower level of the bunker, and there was blood splattered everywhere. There was a pistol laying next to him and a radio clutched tightly in his other hand. He had been monitoring all the media reports through the radio. The gun that was used to kill Lynette and Kayleen was also found in the bunker. And thankfully, I, I didn't see too many, but I did see one or two netizens comment on how Nobody around Peter could have foreseen something like this. Like, how is that possible? And I think that's the terrifying part. There were no blatant red flags. I mean, there were some quirks here and there, but most relationships, most families have those. Even the King County Sheriff stated, Peter's behavior is irrational. Combined with a high level of preparation and intelligence, it's a very unusual case. No one could even think of a motive for the killings. Why didn't he just leave his family instead of murdering them? Was he worried that he might have to pay alimony? That doesn't make sense because he was excited to rob banks and pharmacies. This does not sound like this type of guy to listen to a judge about paying his wife every single month. He could have just vanished. Others wonder if he genuinely thought the end was near and believed that a double homicide would kind of just not be a big deal. Perhaps maybe he thought December 12th, 2012 was when the world would go down and nobody would care about his warrant anymore. But that doesn't make sense either because he put in a lot of effort to try and get rid of all the evidence, like trying to burn his entire house down. He even made dangerous pipe bombs. Others stated that Peter was such a narcissist that he felt like his wife and daughter were extensions of him. And without him, their lives would just cease to exist. They would be meaningless. And since he didn't want them anymore, he would just have to kill them. Which is 
terrifying thought. To a lot of people, the last theory makes the most sense because he does seem like a raging narcissist. And what Peter's ultimate plans were, to this day, they remain a mystery. What was the virus lab about? Was he trying to create a doomsday so that he could live out a sick fantasy of being in the woods, living off the grid? Did he want to see everybody else suffer because of how he was treated? A lot of netizens pointed out the fact that Peter seems incredibly insecure about himself. Even while planning the double homicide of his own family members, he talks about how he was ugly and how his personality was too boring. And what's wild is Lynette was too good for him. Like not in the obvious ways, but just visually. Peter was able to marry someone that was leagues above him. She was a great mother. She was someone that was part of the community. She was kind, grateful, and yet he felt injustice. It's weird. I mean, yeah. despite him being, in his own words, ugly and boring, Lynette gave him a chance. And all she did was give him love during their marriage. So that's why people think he's a narcissist, because nothing is ever really good enough for a narcissist. And side note about Peter being a narcissist, I don't really believe in being an armchair psychiatrist, but I do think that it's interesting to note that he does retakes in his videos, which is odd, considering it seems like he wanted the videos to be burned in the house fire, but at the same time, he wanted to make sure that he's presenting himself in the best light possible, which I guess adds to why people believe he was a raging narcissist, because a lot of narcissists, regardless of if they think someone is going to see it or not, they like to present themselves in a very specific light. But just the whole thing is odd. Peter had such a strong survival instinct. I mean, he spent eight years and thousands of dollars trying to create his own doomsday bunker. But on the other hand, he was like ready to exit his life if police came to him for the murders. It's odd that he was so obsessed with survival, but also so ready to die. It's so weird that he spent eight years prepping for this moment. This is what he decided to do at the end for his loved one and, and himself. It's just so bizarre. I do think that, um, again, going to the narcissist theory that a lot of netizens have, he narcissists tend to overestimate their abilities and capabilities. Mm, yes. He did vlog that he thought that he his goal was to last 10 years after murdering his family. He lasted six days. He didn't think they would find him that quickly. No. Uh, he really thought he was hidden. Okay. But still, like just killing the whole family like that. For literally no reason. I mean, some netizens have also stated that it's interesting that Peter's doomsday was one of his own making. If he had not killed Lynette and Kayleen, I don't mm -hmm. think they would have brought in three dozen yeah. SWAT teams for alimony payments. Yeah, he could have just lived out there by himself. Exactly. And survive. Yeah. That's why people think he's a narcissist. He thinks yeah. that these people, his wife and daughter, do not exist without him. They are not their own entities. They mm. are extensions of him. Right. And if he doesn't want them anymore, they need to die. Even after Peter was confirmed to be dead, a bomb squad descended into the bunker. They needed to test for any booby traps or bombs that Peter could have set up. Once that was cleared, the police took all the weapons. The bunker was destroyed and filled with dirt. It was a huge public safety concern in case someone accidentally or purposefully stumbled upon the bunker because, you know, and authorities stated they did let journalists in to take pictures of the bunker afterwards. But pictures do not do it justice, according to authorities. It was amazingly fortified is what the police said. Experts who make bunkers for a living though, they argue differently. They said, the structural integrity is not something I would recommend for anyone. The critical part of bunkers is the roof. His bunker worked to hold up the dirt, but it didn't do much more than that. Yeah. A lot of bunker specialists said, you have to buy bunker roofs that are blast load roofs, meaning they can hold and support up to 24,000 pounds per square foot. So there's that. But we do know that Peter Keller had also been hoarding cash in the bunker. We don't know exactly how much. We just know that before he went off the grid, he had withdrawn at least $6,200 from a local Chase bank. And authorities said the total sum was somewhere in the tens of thousands. Lynette's side of the family has taken the money and they have chosen to establish a scholarship fund in Kayleen's memory with it. It's kayleensfund.com for women who attend DigiPen Institute of Technology in Redmond, where Kayleen was hoping to study video game design. The family said in a statement, Lynette and Kayleen were two amazing individuals who will be missed by our family each and every day. We take some comfort in knowing that they were together and that one day we may see them again. And that is the story of Peter Keller and his twisted bunker vlogs. What are your thoughts? Please stay safe, and I will see you guys on Wednesday for the next episode. Bye.